Thank you so much for having me. I'm truly honored to be here with such a, an esteemed group of speakers. And uh, I've really enjoyed my time at Biola. The students are brilliant, and everyone's been fantastic. So thanks so much for having me. So let's see here. I'm just going to bring this up. Can I get that slide on the screen? Thank you so much. So um, as an artist, I'm interested in how the future of art relates to the body and how the seed of the future may be hidden within an embodied practice that explores the vast knowledge of what we might term the prophetic body. In the sense that the body unifies word and form, it performs its creative agenda with an incarnational intelligence, which the political agendas of feminism and body-based live art have longed for. Its breath is inspiration and its lifeblood is love. Renowned performance art historian Rosalie Goldberg, the founder of Performa, has recently argued that the flourishing of performance art since the 1960s and its recent inclusion in the programs of major museums throughout the world and the subsequent transformative effect this inclusion has had on these institutions indicates that we are in the midst of the age of performance art. Alongside this, what I think to be a very agreeable claim, I suggest something slightly more specific that a new age of the prophetic body could very well be upon us. From the Old Testament prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah to medieval mystics like Francis of Assisi and Teresa of Avila, to contemporary performance artists like Marina Abramovich and Francis Elise, the prophetic body is a shape-shifting phenomenon which has surfaced throughout the whole of human history. Conceptually speaking, the body itself becomes prophetic at the point which an inspired expression of personal sacrifice gives way to an uncovering of a truth about the human heart. Its ultimate purpose is to point toward a regeneration of being, or what we might call simply a healing. The prophetic body begins to surface and shimmer when one enters into a dynamic state of absolute surrender. And we might note here that surrender is the prerequisite for this extreme type of dynamism or becoming, since anything short of it is bound to produce a sort of enslavement to stasis of some form or another. Visions of the prophetic body are intended to produce an awakening. The prophetic body willingly bears the wounds of the world in a variety of ways, often in quite performative ways if we look at the history of performance art from the um, Old Testament prophets onward. In order to petition for a peaceful transition of humanity away from violence and to signal the remembrance of and, the, and to trigger the desire for a divine healing. So in this, there is an underlying intention within the prophetic body that its physical discomforts and wounds would somehow, quite mysteriously, miraculously, we might say, uh, be transformed into holy wounds that heal. It is a body which obediently embraces the often strange and bizarre directives of the eternal creative spirit, the author of all prophecy, as we know from Peter who has crafted this ephemeral Aurorian body throughout the ages explicitly for the purpose of lovingly inviting humanity back into intimate union. For the purposes of today's discussion, I shall refer to this spirit by the title used by artists throughout the ages, simply the creative muse. Finally, the prophetic body in its wide array of manifestations can be described most precisely as a revelatory refracting image of the simultaneously transcendent and eminent and peacemaking body of the historical figure of Jesus Christ. In my creative practice, I work with the body and the image as sites of encounter with a dynamic mystical reality. I am ever interested in catching fleeting glimpses of this mysterious but always central prophetic body and mining what it has to teach me, particularly about the full cycle of bodily restoration, which lies at the heart of the creative act. At the core of my practice is an interest in intimacy, 
and an ongoing investigation of the kinds of non-deterministic images which are generated through the processes of intensive relationship. My work incorporates a diverse array of mediums with an emphasis on live performance art and process-centered photography. I'll briefly walk you through my significant investigations of the prophetic body, starting with my process-related, process-centered photography. After that, I'll share some more recent performance artwork. Created in 2008, Hillman plus Chavez imagines how the drama of the body's becoming and its ultimate fulfillment take place within the crucible of creation. Darkness and light, form and formlessness, life's liminality, Commissioned for the inaugural exhibition of the New York nonprofit gallery, Affirmation Arts, this work tells an integrated story of spiritual evolution through, rather than in spite of, the vehicle of the body. It places the body at the center of this universal story. And in these works, my models and I are quite literally performing the image. Each image was created using a complex improvised choreographic technique, which I have developed for the still image. Each unique ilfochrome print explores the notion of light and shadow, dimensions of the subject coexisting in a single field of vision. This principle is technically expressed through the hybrid technique of combining the digital photograph with the static silhouette system of the photogram in the darkroom. My models are represented on a one-to-one -one life size scale in both positive and negative form. Of this technique of imagery creation, the former New Museum curator Gary Sangster writes, this work conveys a strong sense of otherworldly engagement. The intensity of this kind of gestural performance in making the work is a process very different from that of most traditional and contemporary photography. It is much more akin to the improvisation practices of painting, performance, experimental music, and dance. The static authority and didactic efficiency of the camera and of film technologies have rarely permitted intuitive and speculative events to drive the construction of imagery. In this work, it was my intention to counter the reductionist, alienating, voyeuristic violence of a lot of kinds of representation. I, to give Babette uh, a shout out, not all types of representation uh, bear this kind of violence. So I think it, that's an important point to make. Um, but in terms of kind of countering the reductionist, uh, alienating, voyeuristic forms of, of representation, which are quite violent, um, I looked at instead placing the dynamism originally present within the relationship between artist and model at the very center of the image making process. And indeed, to a great extent, the process it itself became the subject. Thus, process and subject are one. Just as the conceptual subject was a spiritual evolution, the process of making each image was itself an evolution. Because the processual becoming nature of the body dominated my creative methodology, these are the sorts of images which tremble, flutter, shimmer, and dare to breathe. Because this work was created upon the highly light sensitive ilfochrome medium in which the image, is, uh, the image of light is positively rather than negatively transferred. This series of work was created in total darkness. Each photogram was improvised in studio. Working without the usual advantage of eyesight, my dancer models and I relied upon the senses of touch and proprioception of the more subtle aspects of the each other's body, aspects such as body heat and even the electromagnetic energy fields that dancers train themselves to perceive. Needless to say, these circumstances gave birth to a collaborative intimacy, an intense concentration, and a deep trust between my models and I as I choreographed their movements through the pitch black studio filled with equipment. If we pull away for a moment from the mechanistic representational confines of the historical definition of image, which we might say clinically, in a very oversimplified way, but it, we might say clinically describes the properties of the other and relies on external appearances. What becomes available to us is a very different image by nature. This is the, Im this is the image of an organismic, vibrant uh, re reflection of a relationship in progress. This primordial image cannot be made or produced. Uh, it is rather called into being. It is born, the very child of relationship. Most profoundly, man himself is such an image. Creation is the emanation of relational harmony. 
in short. Long before the distance between the subject and object existed, the image was a dynamic site of presence, intimate union, and life. And this is precisely what I try to excavate in my visual and performance art. In my following work, A Thousand Rainbows, created in 2011, I deepened this exploration as the intimacy with my models grew through the process and practice of dance. As a lifelong dancer, dance has become for me an exploration of inner space, if we are to think of space as referring to the outlays of human consciousness. And the movement of dance is a response to journeys, visions, and encounters which take place in this unseen realm. In this work, the viewer is taken on a journey through a sort of interior space as visions from the body, uh, visions from both uh, the consciousness, body consciousness, uh, and encounters with the creative muse are uncovered through the vehicle of contemporary improvisational dance. Alongside this, I draw parallels between objects within inner space and those in the far reaches of outer space as glimpsed by contemporary eyes through the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. As a general rule, I don't use digital manipulation in my photographic imagery. Instead, I work with natural processes which emphasize the consciousness revealed through the body and the poetics of the most basic physical phenomena, such as the propagation of light, the passage of time, the geometry of space, and the motion of bodies. A Thousand Rainbows imagines flesh as a clay-like and willingly formed and reformed by these profoundly physical forces. Whether pondering the mysteries of the night sky or creating imagery in uh, the pitch black, I'm interested in the interplay between light and shadow and how together they author to conspire and experience. From observing the physical universe, we know that form is a manifestation of relationship between two forces. By way of various improvisational dance techniques, such as Gaga, uh, the Gaga method, for example, or contact improvisation, I re have recreated this dialectical drama between myself and my model within the microcosm of the studio. I am personally present within each frame, dressed from head to toe in black as a stagehand, as I invisibly direct and illuminate the process. These images uh, were born directly from the intimate a dance exchange between my model and I. So these images are materializations of our interaction. The vital image, most fundamentally, is reciprocated presence. It comes into appearance through the intensification of engagement uh, between mutually empowered subjects. In the case of this imagery, those subjects are the artist and the model. Exploring links between the formation of heavenly bodies and earthly ones, I investigate the form of relationship, which, like many undulating forms in the heavens, such as the aurora borealis, for example, cannot be precisely measured, categorized, or diagrammed. Each surreal optical effect is achieved naturally in camera. This condition enables me to explore physical realities, such as the shape of time and architecture made observable through the durational technology of open shutter phot photography. To engage the prophetic body through the medium of the nude is to explore the body as an agent of infinite semiotic inventiveness, which travels beyond the reaches of the known into that which we might call the strange or the glorious or terrifying or even holy, uh, a newborn beauty, to, to say it very simply, which is so awesome that it literally takes the breath away and with it any words that that breath might have intended to carry. It is a chart for linguistic discovery, a sort of map of, of the heavens, as William Blake has suggested, both within and above. The body's restoration after violence has long been a personal passion of mine. I'm fascinated by how the cycle of the body's birth, its breaking, and its rebirth forms a basis for language, creation, and beauty. Drawing from an in-depth knowledge of one another, this process frequently tests the physical and psychological limits of my model and I. These images were born from moments of sacrificial commitment, elation, awe, and sheer physical exhaustion. 
In one such incident, my model, a world-renowned dancer who's worked anonymously for me, with, with me and for me for years, um, collapsed from the strenuous choreographic phrase which rendered the piece Last Confessions of a Dying Star. This phenomenon is experienced by many dancers when the expressive peak of a performance is reached and the body demands an immediate and often violent evacuation of the stomach or the colon. Um, it's really quite violent. This, uh, this zenith of expression bears close parallels to the phenomenon, for example, of the supernova, um, which is frequently triggered by a sudden, sudden gravitational collapse in the core of an aging massive star, which releases gravitational potential energy. Supernovae are exceptionally luminous and create a burst of radiation that briefly outshines an entire galaxy before gradually fading from view. Over this brief interval, a supernova can expel as much energy as our sun is expected to emit over an entire lifespan. The explosion radiates as much, uh, radiates much or all of the star's material at a velocity of up to 30,000 kilometers per second, and that's like 10% of the speed of light, so it's pretty fast. Um, this, derive, this drives a shock wave into the nearby interstellar medium and the shock wave sweeps up kind of a, a sort of swelling shell of gas and dust that is called the supernova remnant. Now we'll go on to recent performance work very briefly. Um, so I'll read this quote to you by um, Abbott Suzer. It's the basis for the title of my next work that I'm going to share with you. Bright is the noble work, but being nobly bright, the work should brighten the minds so that they might travel, they may travel through the true lights to the true light. The dull mind rises to truth through that which is material and in seeing this light is resurrected from its former submersion. Last September, I embarked on my 90-day performance, True Light. It was an endurance performance and the name derives from the quote that I just read by the uh, father of Gothic art and architecture, Abbot Suzer. In this performance, I sought to further develop the kind of intimacy-led, process-centered image making which had evolved in my studio practice. Only this time, instead of creating images which materialized the interactions between my model and I, I sought myself to embody the very image of relational harmony by placing my own being at the generative center of the relationship between artist and the creative muse. What would become of me if I surrendered my life to becoming the image child of this intimate relationship? How would this affect the chasm between my life and my art? What kind of art would I then make if I fully embraced the call to be made? I was deeply interested in what kind of embodied image would result from this radical yet ancient approach and how this might build upon or burst the themes of dynamism, duration, and ontological becoming, which had so haunted my work. I was also curious how this experience would affect the kind of work I created as an artist. I made intimacy with the spirit of creation, the great muse, my only definite artistic agenda, and sought to become open to whatever inspirations came through this process. The inspiration for True Light itself arrived in the form of a very defined assignment one late summer day in 2012, which I then immediately committed to carrying out. The parameters involved a full 90-day juice fast while integrating 30 days of the art of prayer during the month of September, followed by 30 days of meditation during the month of October, and finally culminating in 30 days of silence in the month of November. Collectively, these methods became ways of researching the phenomenon of artistic inspiration. True Light marked just the beginning of a much longer process of converting each aspect of my life into an art material. Quite quickly, it became evident that the absolute surrender to the muse was to become really a, a creative methodology in and of itself. It's such a seemingly simple proposition, but it quickly uncovered a delicate process that can be likened to how an instrument must be constantly tuned in order to consistently produce a resonant sound. And in the process, I embarked on what I would discover to be a new thesis of performance art as being the practice of living a supernatural life in a natural way. 
But from the perspective of the restoration of being, this, of course, is the most ancient thesis of all. The embodied image generated by the performance parameters was also uh, used to symbiotically develop a body of new visual and performance artwork. The process quickly proved to be quite fecund and prolific, as one would imagine how an image behaves when two mirrors face each other and reproduce an infinity of image iterations. Or another example of that might be how a mystery is reflected back and forth infinitely between two souls when they gaze into another. Or finally, how the eye as the subject resists reductive penetration when it encounters the camera eye, but instead invites a kind of delving deeper within. As my creative practice, uh, as, with, as with my traditional creative practice, I continued to spend a great deal of time in the pitch black, meditatively seeking visions and inspirations for new work, and delving more deeply into an exploration of what the eye sees when the spirit is intently focused. Thanks to the help of the Huffington Post Art, social media, and a passionate documentary film crew uh, who incidentally learned about the project only days before it began, I was able to share the journey of True Light through a variety of channels, including a feature-length documentary film, which uh, has already been mentioned. I'll show stills from that film throughout this presentation. Briefly, I'll share two performance works that were inspired directly through the True Light journey um, that are especially pertinent to today's discussion about peace in art. Both performances were created in response to the first month of prayer. My general modality of creative inspiration underwent a fairly radical transformation during True Light. I embarked on the process with an extensive history of utilizing improvisational performance methods uh, to create this performance or process-oriented imagery that I've already shared with you. Um, throughout the journey of True Light, my creative process shifted toward one of receiving very clear directives from the muse, which I then simply carried out. Oftentimes, these directives would arrive at the last minute, as is the case with the performance Heal Us, Heal You Us, uh, for which I received instructions really only the moment before the performance began. The overall creative agenda revealed and developed through this 90-day process was clearly one of peace petitioning and healing through art, and this granted me more flickering encounters with that enigmatic uh, pr prophetic body that I mentioned earlier. The 11th day of the performance coincided with the 11th anniversary of September 11th. The inspiration to create a performative intervention for the commemoration was commanding and persistent, but also terribly vague. In the evening before the uh, anniversary, I received a mental image of a mop in a bucket, but nothing more. On Tuesday, September 11th, 2012, I grabbed my mop, bucket, and cleaning supplies and set out for ground zero with no particular idea of how those supplies would be used. I eventually found myself on the west side of Zuccotti Park, an Iraq war veteran, a 9-11 first responder, and a family, uh, a family member of a 9-11 victim were um, embroiled in a heated argument about war's wickedness and institutional deception and Wall Street's greed, among many other things. The air was thick with the kind of trauma-induced anger which often precedes flying fists. My first instinct was to keep my distance. At that precise moment, I prepared to walk away. The familiar voice of the muse spoke, clearly indicating that this would be the place. Uh, admittedly, I reluctantly very reluctantly set down my cleaning supplies. Drawing the roller sponge mop from the soapy water, I placed it on the pavement, feeling frightened, foolish, and perfectly absurd. Um, it, it was at that precise moment that the words heal us rang unquestionably in my mind. I proceeded to write those letters in, uh, the, those words in block letters, creating uh, a sort of typography based on the, uh, the stone pavement. The altercation progressively grew more abusive and the crowd migrated directly over the words I had scrubbed into the pavement. The stone was hot from the blazing noonday sun and the soapy waters quickly evaporated. Once the phrase was complete, I immediately returned to the beginning and re-scrubbed over the letters, making, uh, making them visible again. 
The two primary ringleaders then jerked toward one another and exchanged threats of physical violence. I found myself standing between them, prepared to embark on a new brushstroke. <laughs> a man from the crowd shouted, don't hit the girl. I paused, I took a deep breath, and I continued to mop and scrub with my gaze fastened to those letters on the pavement. A couple of young men approached the scene holding an American flag, defining the left perimeter of the crowd. The fighting continued and the airwaves filled with this sort of tragic symphony. The quarrel eventually lost momentum though and the crowd dispersed. And for the next eight hours, I repeatedly washed that prayer into the pavement as a steady stream of passers-by paused for a moment of reflection before continuing on. I repeated this action over and over until I reached the point of true exhaustion. By then, the stone surface beneath the letters had become washed and brightened. As I scrubbed the phrase into the stone one last time, a man dressed in a three-piece suit, built like a linebacker, approached me and introduced himself. He said, my name is Chris. I've worked in this neighborhood for many years. I realized last night that I'm finally ready to face the pain of what I experienced here on September 11th, but I was surprised to find myself holding on to so much anger. At this point, Chris began to weep uncontrollably. When he caught his breath, he said to me, as I came out of the office tonight, I saw these words and they really helped me. Thank you. We shared a few tears and reflected on the process of finding the strength and courage to heal before parting ways. And I wandered home that night with my mop and bucket in hand, completely astonished. Um, my second performance, which I'll only briefly share since we're running out of time, um, I called Refracting Temple. Restore NYC is a recognized pioneer in the fight against sex trafficking in New York City. Its groundbreaking residential program features the first and only long-term safe houses dedicated to the holistic needs of uh, foreign national survivors of sex trafficking in the Northeast. When I first approached Restore with the, re with the request to pray over their safe house, which is a, a new safe house, um, they're in the process of establishing several new safe houses throughout the New York, New Jersey area. Um, I, I feared that the inquiry would be dismissed as irreverently eccentric. Fortunately for me, the folks at Restore possess not only a liberal imagination, but a sophisticated understanding of the unique breakthroughs that art can help facilitate in a client's intensive healing process. Restore provides a kaleidoscopic array of therapeutic modalities, including yoga and therapy and art therapy, to help ensure that the trauma traumatized women who come to them have a real chance at holistic restoration and hope for a new empowered life. After a brief tour of the decidedly warm and beautiful house, the safe house coordinator presented me with a crimson box wrapped in a blood red satin bow. I delicately untied the bow and lifted the lid to discover an inscription upon the inside. It said simply, believe. Within the box, I discovered countless prayer requests written by the residents, penned mostly in Spanish, each one folded with a deliberate symmetry. I felt completely bewildered by the residents' openness in cooperating with my desire to pray for them. One by one, I read through the detailed requests, collecting insights that helped guide my prayers over the house. I then proceeded room by room, progressing as though through a large body. Within the lower re regions of the house, I found myself praying for the most obvious of needs, community and belonging, sustenance and warmth, the development of professional skills. As I ascended to the home's upper, more interior regions containing the bedrooms and the washroom, I was drawn to pray over concerns of a more psychological nature, such as feelings of shame, depression, confusion, and fear. As I finished my last prayer in the quiet retreat of the washroom, I was struck by how a space reserved for the most common base of actions was also the most monastic of the entire house. At the end of my meager, meager, meager petitioning for restoration of lives in such incomprehensible, incomprehensibly difficult circumstances, I truly felt the weight of my own barrenness. The bathroom was comfortable and serene with a generous shower and a whirlpool bathtub. As I peered at the shower head, I was reminded of Rania Maria Rilke's 
words, O oh, tireless gi giver, holy cataract, conductor of the inexhaustible one. And here in a vision of a shower head, but uh, also in the sort of suggested presence of the home's inhabitants and the, the body, the kind of corpus of the home itself, I encountered a glimpse of that prophetic body at work. My gaze fixed on a damp washcloth dangling from the shower handle. I was equally overwhelmed by the thought of the immeasurable amount of healing required as I was by the idea of a power able to administer a regeneration in the wake of such profound suffering. There are various other works from True Light addressing the intersection of art and peace, which I wish I had time to discuss in detail, but thanks to the fantastic group show that Jeff Rao has curated in the Biola University Gallery, you'll get to see a small sampling of those at this evening's opening. The documentary film True Light is planned for completion later this year. Um, in short, though, I know my journey into the poetics and the pragmatics of uniting art and life really have only just begun. In this ongoing practice of art work as life work, I will seek to be ever more receptive to the vision of this precious prophetic body and the healing uh, that's in, that it brings into the world. As, uh, as one watches the night sky for a wondrous appearance of the aurora borealis or shooting stars, for it is the working of this particular body throughout the history of art which has drawn human artistic attempts beyond the realm of violence, um, of the violence truly of temporal limitation into a vision of an eternal synthesis of all things. Thank you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out Leah, how thank Biola you so much. can make a difference uh, in your life. I hope you all are getting a sense of, of the gathering.